evening. Welcome to NPA this fine morning. We're excited to be in the house of God, and I know God has great things in store. Our kingdom kids are in our service with us this morning, and uh, so we're excited to have them here for the worship time, and then they will be dismissed to their own service. But we are looking forward to a great service. You know, we've introduced a number of our Bible college students, and we have a few interns, and we get to hear from one of them this morning, and we're looking forward to Katie bringing forth the word of God this morning. And we want to start by just opening our service in a word of prayer. Let's just bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. And Lord, we just thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives and in our hearts. And Father, I pray right now for those that are going through difficult times, those that are facing uh, physical troubles or uh, financial difficulties. Father, you know each one, the difficulties that people are facing with their jobs or any situation, Father, you know. And Father, we pray right now for Harold Murphy as he's struggling with his body. God, we ask your touch to be upon him. We ask for Darlene as well, that you'd give her your strength. And as she just takes care of him, that uh, the peace that passes understanding would just be her portion. Father, you are there with us when we go through difficulties as we face pain and suffering. And Father, as we watch our loved ones face pain and suffering. And so this morning we know that uh, there's hope nowhere other than in your name, Father. And so we come before you and ask that you would just continue to pour your spirit out upon us. And Father, we thank you that you are such a good God. And this morning we worship you. And uh, we look forward to what you're going to do in the lives of each one who's here and those that are able to watch online. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing the goodness of God this morning. Why don't you stand with me and let's just worship the Lord together. I love you, Lord.
what a faithful God we serve, don't we? He is so awesome this morning. I'm going to call Brother Godwin up here. We have some awesome, exciting news of how good God is. Come on up here, Godwin, and the rest of you, you can just wave at someone as you're seated. God is so awesome. We are very excited to have a couple announcements here this morning. Come on up, Godwin. Can we have that mic on, I guess? Okay. Thank you very much. And good morning, everybody. My brothers and sisters, um, my story is very, very transparent and open to everybody. God has been very faithful. He said, this song is amazing to my life. Um, my wife just gave birth to a baby girl. Yes. In short, I was uh, pushing that uh, all of us would be here this morning. But the sleepless night and all this, <laughs> she couldn't make it. I said, okay, uh, well, it's understandable. Uh, please help me thank the Lord. It was a journey that nobody knew that it could happen. Um, I remember when I started coming to this church, I was coming with my little three kids, and uh, Kenny was still not working. He has not even started working that time. Now I look at it, Kenny is growing, and the girls are becoming young ladies and then um, it was a challenging uh, for me to bring up the kids and I prayed God and I prayed God I tried going doing it my own it wasn't working and uh, I tell you briefly how I met this uh, my I love <laughs> I have a baby girl. I said it before. <laughs> it's a baby girl on, 30, on 28th of um, September. Yes, I just want to give you a short story how everything happened. Um, when it, when I, I prayed God and God said, well, you got to move on with life, I said, okay. I tried starting a new relationship after my divorce. It was difficult for me. It was really hard, so I kind of resigned. But I had some people recommending people from everywhere. I had my friend going to Nigeria, my country of birth, to marry. I told him, don't go to Nigeria. <laughs> because most of us that marry and come here, now you see our situation. And the guy said, well, that's where I want to go. I said, okay. He went, it didn't work. He went the second time, it didn't work. He married, married twice and got divorced twice within three years. And then he got married here and in, they are living well now. But in my own situation, I've concluded, well, I'm not going back there. But God said, that's where you are going to marry. So eventually somebody just recommended gift to me. I went home to see her. Um, we've been talking on the phone. And then I went home, saw her on a Tuesday night. And then we talked. So okay, I think you are just as you are talking, uh, we are talking on the phone. I think I'm okay with you. She said, I'm okay with you. <laughs> I'm okay with then that. on Wednesday, we went, I went to see the family. And I told the family, I'm going back to Canada on Friday. And I need to get married to your daughter tomorrow. <laughs> and they said, that, 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 you know that's not possible. I said, with God, everything is possible. And then they discussed and discussed. They asked her questions and he answered them and said, okay, well, let's see. Let's, so in our tradition, you have to do introduction, um, see the family introduction, then uh, the general marriage before you now go for church wedding. They said, okay, we have waived this one for you. Let it be introduction. But how are you going to put a date for the general uh, marriage with the whole community, and then put a date for church wedding, and then if you can
can do all these things within today and tomorrow. That's okay. <laughs> I said, okay, we'll see. And then we left, left it like that, not knowing that I've discussed with the family, the inner family, and I told them my situation and they've agreed. So the following day, they've already made, contacted the registry and everything. So on Thursday, we went to registry and got married. So I saw her for the first time in my life on Tuesday. We got, saw the family uh, on Wednesday. On Thursday, we got married. And then on Friday, I held my marriage certificate and jumped on the plane back to Canada. <laughs> so, so I came back and then started bringing the, getting the documents and all this. So January 2017, I filed for her. And we kept uh, believing in God. Everything will work out well, this and that. And uh, it worked out well uh, that uh, by January the next day, 2018, she was given a visa to come and join me. So I had to go home and bring her by 2018. And we have been together since then. On coming to my family, she just seamlessly got in with my kids. Mm -hmm. And then January, um, September 2018, she took in. And uh, all of a sudden, after three months, it was not developing well. So they decided, no, this is not a viable uh, pregnancy. It was terminated. Uh, it's, it's as painful as it could be to anybody, especially for a young woman that I've been looking forward for that over the years, and it's not that he's uh, 18 years old or 20 years old. So, but we prayed God, we got over that. After a while, she said, no, we have to go for IVF and this. I said, no, believe in God. I read my Bible. Uh, Isaiah, there's a place I he said, I will, keep, I will save you, I will save your children. I will keep you safe. With my right, righteous right hand, I will keep you safe. I read the other place that, by the, lamb of, the blood of the Lamb of God and by their testimonies, they were mm -hmm. saved. Amen. I said, okay. She was, I, I said, I understand. And then we said, Let's, let me save and make money for it. We started, we started going for this test. Every test is okay, it's okay, it's okay. Then we have to start the, the um, procedure by, February, by March. Okay. By March, we are to start the procedure. She said she thinks she has taken in. She went and bought a test, and this was positive. Amen. I said, okay, you call them. You are the one who contacted them, and I've contacted my God. You contact them and cancel the appointment. <laughs> so she called them and canceled the appointment. They said, okay, you have to contact your GP and make sure that it's true. Contacted the GP, everything was developing well. Okay. We kept going. And then I said, okay, now I've saved some money. Okay, maybe it's uh, God, you've given me this money. I've never saved this amount of money in my, in my life at, at Ed Edmonton. Okay, let's go and look for a house so that we'll move. Uh, oh, they said, if you want to go, you better sell this house and then you move to a new house, you put a good down payment, and then you, it will be easy mortgage. I put my house on sale. The Lord said, you, you are not going to sell it. Nobody is going to put offer for it. And I woke up, I told my wife, this is what I heard the Lord tell me. Okay, well, let's see. The house was on, on the market for more than a month and a half. People were coming at least three times every week to view the house. Everybody saying it's good, it's nice, this, but nobody put offer on it. And I, I contacted the realtor, I said, what is happening? Oh, it may be because you put the price so high. What price do you want? She said, you put it this price. Okay, you, you are the one who put it any price you want. She lowered the price and put it on, on the market again. 
Nobody put any offer on it. Meanwhile, we've been shopping around, getting different houses. We go, we view this one. Mm, I don't like the way the step looks. Okay. Oh, I don't like the way the kitchen is looking. But God has blessed you. You found a house, right? Amen. <laughs> and a beautiful so, baby girl. Every day is a blessing. Amen. Every day is a blessing. Amen. And God. all I tell the people of God, when you pray to God, hold on to your prayer. Amen. It may not be the time you want yes. it. It may not be what you want, but God directs our footsteps. Amen. And you will get what is desirable for you. Amen. Thank you so much. And we rejoice with you, Godwin. And his wife's name is Gift, and she is a gift to him as well. They were up here leading worship last Sunday, and on, I guess it was Tuesday the 28th, is the 28th Tuesday, they had a baby girl. And we're growing with one baby girl and a second baby girl born the same day. Samuel and Christina also had a baby girl on September 28th. So two beautiful baby girls this week. A uh, couple other announcements we want to make this coming Tuesday, ladies' morning out, is in the fellowship hall. Wednesday night, we are here for Bible study in service and on YouTube if you want to tune in there as well. The youth and the kids are upstairs. And on Friday, the youth are going to play park games. You're meeting here at 7 p.m. Uh, we just want to also announce that this Sunday or this week is this month is membership month. So on October 31st, we will be receiving new members into new people into membership. And so next Sunday, Pastor Jonathan and I will be preaching together about membership. We will be having forms out there for those of you that are not members. And then on the 24th, anyone who would like to become a member will meet with the board. And then we will receive you into membership on the 31st. And we encourage you to very prayerfully consider, if you're not a member already and you consider this your church home, you have to be in attendance for six months. And then we would like you to make sure you apply for membership. Uh, we do only receive members twice a year and then you're in membership in time for the annual meeting in um, April and so we look forward to that we also want to just pray a quick blessing over our offering for those of you that are here the offering plates are in the foyer if you're online you can give at npachurch.org and let's just pray a quick blessing over the offering this morning Precious Father, we thank you for the gifts that you have given to us. Father, we rejoice in the, the two new lives that have come into our church this week. And Father, you are such a good God. You give us, you're so faithful and you bless us immensely. Father, above what we could even ask or think. And so this morning, Father, we want to bless you. We want to give back to you from what you've given to us. And may we honor you with everything that we have and with all that we do and say. In your precious name we pray, amen. Amen. At this time, soul is coming. Let's uh, open our hearts to worship the Lord this morning. Hallelujah to God Almighty for his faithfulness upon our life. Shall we all rise? And let us hand over everything to God this morning. Let us focus on him. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen.
Lord God Almighty, whether you are young or old, black, white, green, or yellow, is here to meet you at the point of your needs. Amen. presence of the Lord. God has been so good to us. Just keep worshiping the Lord and it will meet you at the point of your needs.
our strength and is the center of our life. Amen. upon Jesus because he cares for you. Let us all hand over everything to the King of Kings and the Lord of Love, Jesus Christ.
Yeah, we give you praise, Lord. You have only what's good for us in store. And if we will give our lives to you, you will make something beautiful of us. You take the brokenness in our lives and you bring healing and fix it. And you make a beautiful work of art out of us. Because you know the plans that you have for us. They're not plans of darkness. They're not plans of destruction. They're not plans that would leave us empty. But they're plans that would bring order into our lives. Order uh, in place of disorder. And you you desire to fill us with every good thing. And so, Lord, we give you thanks that we can trust you. We give you thanks you've shown yourself to have our best interest at heart and that while we were your enemies, you died for us. And so, Lord, we thank you that if we ask anything according to your will, that you say that it will be done for us. How good you are, how wonderful it is to be part of your people. And, Lord, that's the message that you have for the world, that you love them and desire that they would know you and be in relationship with you and be, become part even of, of your, your plan and will for the world. And we just give you praise this morning in your name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Um, it is uh, my privilege, to, first of all, to I want to release the Kingdom Kids to their program. So if you're between the ages of 3 and 12, if kids 3 to 12 years old, if you would like to, you can go upstairs to the Kingdom Kids room. Um, and uh, there it is, I know, it always a, a fun time. Um, the kids look forward to this even throughout the week. So anyway, it's going to be good. I release you. Um, it is my privilege also to... Uh, introduce, but also just in terms of welcome, Katie Van Zenbeek to preach to us this morning. I know her family, uh, Josh's family in particular, is here. Uh, and uh, But she has, in a sh very short period of time, Josh and Katie have become part of our family as well. And uh, we're very thankful. Just a, a note on in terms of what she's going to be speaking on. She's doing the first part in a series on Titus. And I'm very excited about that. We're also in, in terms of Naomi and, and my preaching series, we're in 1 Timothy. And so this is all part of the pastoral letters. Uh, and it's, it's amazing how what Paul says to Timothy and in this case to Titus is also to all of us. That God doesn't have a message that's just for the leaders. That's it's for all of God's people. We all are his servants. We all desire to live according to his, his will and so um, as, as his people. And so I know you're going to be blessed by what Katie has to say. Uh, she has a message on her heart and it is a good one. And so let's um, give her a hand even as she comes. Come on up, Katie. God bless you. You're going to do great. Thanks. Okay. Good morning. It's good to see all of you. Can you hear me? Thumbs up in the back? Yes? Oh, thank goodness. Cool. I've been often accused of having a very quiet voice, so bear with me. Um, I just want you to imagine with me for a minute. I'm sure you have very good imaginations. Most of us do. Um, you're part of the church in Crete. Let's say it's summertime. So the sun is beating down, 
and it's hot, really hot. Not only is it hot, but Crete is dry in the summertime, which, of course, you know, since you're a Cretan. Here is a picture of what came up when I typed Crete into a Google Images search. No doubt it's edited uh, out the wazoo, but it's still a really good idea of this mountainous Mediterranean island. It looks lovely, doesn't it? I think I'd rather be there than here waiting for snow to fall, hey? <laughs> So Titus, the man that Paul left behind in Crete when he left, has received a letter from Paul. Very exciting. The church that you are a part of, a house church as they usually were in the days of the early church, has gathered to listen to this letter being read. Here today we're only going to read the first chapter, since we don't even really have time to go into much detail on that first chapter. There's a lot in there. Uh, instead, we're going to look at some of the themes found within the first chapter. So here we go. If you would turn with me in your Bibles or swipe on your phone, or it'll be up behind me on the screen, Titus 1. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, and the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago, but at the proper time manifested even his word, in the proclamation with which I was entrusted, according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you, namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced, because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, say Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely, so that they may be sound in the faith not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient, worthless for any good deed. Ouch. <laughs> I would not want to hear that read about me, but... It seems to me that Paul approaches this in a kind of upside-down style. He introduces himself in lovely, standard, theologically rich Pauline fashion. He says who he's writing to, then he describes the mission that Titus was sent on, which will become what we see as part of the solution later. And then he explains what the problem is. So solution, then the problem. So we're gonna look at the parts of the chapter that occur after the introduction in reverse order, starting with the problem. What is the problem? Put simply, the darkness and corruption in Crete and its people. So we're going to take a look at the darkness in Crete, the light of Jesus that can break through it, and the leaders that are to shine it. Now, as a Cretan, because y'all are still Cretans, surprise, <laughs> you are well aware of the spiritual darkness that permeates your island. It's everywhere. No matter where you turn, you can't escape it. Isolated as an island, darkness and sin and evil have spread rampantly. And due to this, the church is not only struggling, they're following, falling into the same traps and some traps that are especially designed for believers. There must have been some sense of conviction among the believers who are hearing this letter. I mean, Paul just called them names they've been called time and again, quoting one of their own people to say that they are in verse 12, always liars, evil beasts, 
filthy gluttons. Ouch. That's not very nice. <laughs> this reputation, though, is unsurprising, considering they were an island of pirates when Rome took over. Pirates have a great reputation, don't they? Uh, then Paul tells Titus to reprimand them severely for this reputation. And he says it's true. What a wake-up call. So here we see Crete as a place and a people who are basically good for nothing. But not only this, Paul says that the believers in Crete are getting trapped by false teaching. It would seem that this false teaching is the teaching of circumcision in particular. He places special emphasis on it. The false teaching on the circumcision is prevalent throughout the New Testament. Jewish people telling Gentiles that they must be circumcised and follow all the laws of Moses as well as having believed in Jesus for their salvation and followed him. This teaches that it is not only by grace through faith we are saved, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. Rather, this teaching of the circumcision teaches that it is by works first, grace second, and then their salvation. That's not how it works. Paul gets angry about this many times throughout his writings, and Titus 1 seems to be no exception, as he declares in verse 11 that these false teachers must be silenced. That's very emphatic. Crete, a place full of people living in evil and unbelief, where even the believers have been led astray by false teaching. How bad had it gotten? Well, Paul says in verses 15 to 16, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. How much darker could it get? Worthless for any good deed. This context reminds me of John 1.5 in the NIV translation, where it says, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. When I was little, I would sometimes get these glow-in-the-dark t-shirts as souvenirs from my grandparents when they'd been on vacation. So I'd have this awesome wolf t-shirt with paw prints that were supposed to glow in the dark, right? And what is the first thing that I would do after thanking my grandparents and putting the shirt over top of whatever else I was wearing, I'd run into the bathroom, one of the few rooms in the house without a window in it, and I'd shut the door, <coughs> plunging myself into darkness. In the darkness, it would be possible to make out the faintest outlines of glow-in-the-dark paw prints marching along my shirt. In the darkness, the light was visible, even though it was just the slightest break in the dark. Now, normally, I avoid the dark. Even now that I'm not a child, it just makes me nervous and disorients me. But there was a bit of light, and that was enough. Since we're on the theme of darkness, here's one more story for you. My family and I moved into a new house when I was 10, and I had a new room in the basement. I was so excited. It had a walk-in closet built under the stairs to the far right of the door, and my mattress was set to the left of the door on our first night there. My mother had me set up with a nightlight that went out after a few minutes to help guide me to the bathroom if I needed it in the night. You know, you push a button and it turns on. Boop. And as it turned out, I did wake up in the night. New house, nervous kid. <laughs> it was pitch black. And although it isn't as obvious now that I wear contacts, without glasses, I am as blind as a bat. In the daytime, never mind at night. At night, I'm hooped. I got out of bed in enough of a hurry that I didn't bother hitting the nightlight to turn it on. I figured I could make it to the door. It was just a straight right angle. No problem, right? So I started to make my way towards the door, hands extended. I might as well have had my eyes shut, honestly. I wandered and wandered, and eventually I brushed up against a wall. Okay, so I walked blindly along the wall until I hit a wire rack attached to the wall. It somehow ended up inside my closet, not at my bedroom door. <laughs> my aim was really great. <laughs> Thankfully, the light switch inside the closet was easy to find, and by the soft glow from the closet, I could find my bedroom door and manage to escape. <sighs> I have been ever aware since then 
of how easy it is to get disoriented when you're surrounded by the dark if you forget to use your light source. The people in Crete were forgetting to use their light source. They were forgetting even what their light source looked like and wandering around in the dark, feeling desperately for anything to guide them. They ended up being tricked by false teaching. The thing is, not only are we supposed to be aware of what our light source is, the word of God, and know who our light source is, Jesus, we are called to be light in a dark world. In Matthew 5, 14 to 16, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but up on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We are to be the light of the world, torches lit by Jesus' fire, shining into the pitch black that has surrounded this world since the fall. The church in Crete was to be a light in a very dark place. But just as a glow-in-the-dark t-shirt will shine brightly in a dark room, their light, lit by a never-ending source, would shine all the brighter on such a dark island. The cool thing about Jesus is he always brings light with him, wherever he goes. We see in Genesis 1-3 that God speaks the word, let there be light. And there it was. It blossomed and burst forth in the darkness, shattering it. Even in the Christmas story, Jesus enters the world and a star bright enough to capture the attention of the Magi shines in the sky. Angels illuminate a field in the dead of night and a small stable cave is warmed with the light of the hope of the world. It's just what Jesus does. And isn't it amazing? If he can do it in a place that had never known light, if he can do it in the night sky, If he can do that in a drafty stable, then he can certainly do it in a dark place like Crete. And lovely news for us, in the darkness of hearts that constantly rebel against God. That's us, just in case you weren't sure. We're good at it. The gospel comes through the command of God for light, for life. Even here in Crete, the gospel comes according to the command of God in verse three. There's always light where there is Jesus. His light shines all the brighter when his people reflect his glory. Now, here's a question for you. Paul talks about the problem of darkness in Crete. We've covered this in depth now. And we know that this darkness needs the light of Jesus. But where does he talk about a specific solution? Is the solution even in this chapter? Maybe I'm going to make you guys wait for Vincent or Josh to finish this up. Or maybe we just need to look earlier in the chapter to see what direction Paul was thinking in. I said it was backwards, right? (laughs) Right after the introduction, Paul introduces the mission that he had left Titus on Crete to fulfill. In Titus 1, 5 to 9, he says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you, namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. Now, you might be wondering how on earth this is a solution to the need to bring light into the darkness of Crete. Bless you. You'll notice here, as Pastor Jonathan has described in past sermons on 1 Timothy, that the traits listed here are character-based, not skill-based. It's a requirement for having a good character. In one of our staff meetings, Vincent quoted the abridged summary of the Bible. Its description of Titus was, The thing for picking leaders is don't pick stupid jerks. This is harder than you think. While this is an amusing summary, it's not inaccurate. The leader that Paul is describing here is someone who lives a Christian life. A man above reproach, husband of one life. One life, wow, one wife. (laughs) Believing children, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. 
These will sound like things that should be expected of your average Christian Joe. Now, I will say that although believers can train their children in the way they should go, raise them to follow Jesus, sometimes the enemy seems to win and they turn away or go astray. This is so heartrending. I've seen it happen far too many times to good Christian parents. There is much sorrow in this. And yet, Paul says this is a necessity. This elder must be able to influence their children strongly enough that they follow Jesus as well. But we have to leave space for children to make their own choices. And while this passage may not mention that, Paul was certainly aware of the choice each person has to follow Jesus. In this specific situation, the Cretan leaders are to be spiritual leaders of their home before they are spiritual leaders of the church. There must be a testing ground, as Pastor Jonathan says at Bible college all the time. But he assures us that Bible college works for this as well. <laughs> it makes sense, especially in a place like Crete, where it's such a life that is completely different from culture and passed on to your children would stand out starkly from those around them. Whether this applies today is honestly really hard to say. But to any parents who are left wondering where they went wrong, sometimes, as hard and heartbreaking as it is, all that can be done is to trust your children to God and pray for them unceasingly. After this, Paul is not done yet. There's more there. He goes on to talk about personality characteristics, such as sensible, just, devout. What I find interesting here is that Paul starts out with the things you're not supposed to be. I wonder if the reason he did this is because they were such common characteristics in Crete. They're not supposed to be self-willed or quick-tempered or addicted to wine and so on. Those all sound like pretty dark things, and that sounds like Crete. The last bit of this section ties us into where he continues on and what we've already covered. Titus 1.9 says, Holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Paul gave them the solution to the false teaching, and not only that, he has given them a solution for how to bring light in and combat the darkness in Crete as well. The leaders in the church of Crete but everywhere as well, are to be examples of people whose lives have been transformed by the saving and changing power of Christ. Their character previously was like any other Cretan, liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Verse 12. I still get stuck on that. Man. But now they must stand out as changed, 180, and shining the light of Jesus into the darkness that they were once a part of. Not only will the light of Jesus shine all the more brightly through them because of the darkness surrounding them, but it will shine all the more brightly because of the contrast. Who these people were versus who Jesus made them to be, between what their lives demonstrated and what he says is right. The contrast is so stark because of the depth of the darkness they came from and the depth of the darkness that still surrounds them because of their physical location. Josh and I are going to be waiting to see where God will send us to minister after we graduate, about two years from now. And I must admit, reading Paul's words about Crete and having done some background research, which just revealed more of Crete's colorful history, this island sounds like a place we would be dismayed to be sent to. There might be conversations of, to such a dark place, Lord? What could we possibly do there? And while, yes, we need to be the kind of people that he can use, and we pray to be more usable for his purposes, his answer might be, well, it's not what you can do there. It's what I can do there. Did you forget? Go shine my light and watch the darkness flee. You know what's wonderful? While I might be scared of the dark, and I'm not afraid to admit it, I'm a child of the light, and I walk in the light whenever I can. <laughs> Um, the Lord of hosts is not afraid of the darkness. And his name, darkness quivers and retreats, waving a white flag. We need to be leaders and believers of a character that God can use and that shines his light into the darkest of places, wherever he will send us. The solution to the darkness in Crete, the darkness in Edmonton, the darkness in the world, is the light of Jesus shining out through his people 
and their transformed lives. So I have a question for you. If someone watched you live, would they be drawn into darkness? Or would the light of Jesus burn an after image into their eyes so all they can see is him? Well, that's great and all, but I'm sure someone is thinking the question, well, how are we supposed to shine his light into the lives of those around us? This is really abstract. How do we reach into the darkness with the light of Jesus? And honestly, I think I can tell you that there's not one way that this must be done. What I can tell you is what Jesus said in John 13, 35. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And in 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. And earlier in 1 John 4, 16 to 18, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. That's a lot of abiding. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. As believers, our lives must be marked by love. It's not always easy, is it? (laughs) Thank God we can find the strength and ability to live lives like this in Jesus. We see this in Titus 2.12. The grace of God teaches us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Our lives should not be marked by just any love, but the love of Jesus. That doesn't look at one person and go, you're an anti-vaxxer, I hope you go to hell. Or, oh, you got the vaccine? Well, you're sinning and I can't even look at you. Now, I hope these are exaggerations, I really do. But the way things are going these days, I honestly wouldn't be surprised. Where is our love? Where is the light that shines for Jesus in the church and in the world? It's certainly not being evidenced as we allow ourselves to divide over issues that, in contrast to seeking the lost and loving our neighbor, what is their eternal significance? Now, I didn't get up here to rant about COVID or vaccines. There's enough of that these days. I think we would all agree. But I do want to say, we are the body of Christ, church. We cannot allow ourselves to get divided over issues like the world does. So instead of dividing, what can we do? We can unite with a common goal. Gee, that sounds familiar. Almost sounds biblical, doesn't it? Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Sure sounds united to me. Rather than asking today how we can fight our neighbor or protest against something, what if you called your neighbor and asked if they had time to chat? Find out how they're doing with everything, because I'm pretty sure they're not doing well. Most of us aren't. Paint the windows of your house with beautiful colors and words that speak of the joy of the Lord, even in the midst of sorrow. Invest in your marriage and your family. Nothing stands out so much in this day as a marriage and a family that have taken priority and as such are thriving. If we are just like the world, how are they supposed to ask what makes us different? What do they have that we don't? Is it a bigger house? No. Must be something in the water. Well, that's great and all, but they aren't going to ask that if we're cowering in fear, hiding our light under a basket, rather than setting it on a lampstand to light the whole house, even in the darkest corners. Hiding in fear, that's no different from everyone else right now. Here's another thought for you, and... Honestly, I speak as much to me as to you. In spending time with Jesus, you are imbued with his love and his light, and eventually, it will start to just seep out, out of your pores. How exciting. It seems a good place to start, spending time with the one whose presence made Moses' face glow. Not only that, but his love 
can cast out the fear of this dark time and empower us to be love, to be lights, and to be transformed. Speaking for myself, I need to do a lot more of all this shining. The guys in a world this dark and bleak, to quote my mother-in-law, it's not that hard to look shiny. We just need some Jesus, some love, and to do some stepping out. Now, this is what I believe is one of the most important parts of a sermon, and that's the part where I hope and pray that God has touched someone's heart in a new way, despite me. If there is anyone here who has not gotten to know Jesus before, not accepted the free gift of salvation that he has extended, though we don't deserve it, I want to encourage you to come talk to me, to Pastor Jonathan, to Pastor Naomi, I think she's upstairs, to Dr. Feller, or I think pretty much to any of us here, part of the congregation. We love Jesus, and we would be so thrilled to pray with you to accept him, or to even just chat with you about him. <coughs> While the f- Christian family is far from perfect, as we see in the believers in Crete, we are joined by the bonds of grace and the love of God. And believe me, there's nothing that compares. If you already know Jesus personally, then I want to ask you to be considering the lesson we can learn from Titus 1. The light of Jesus, shining through his people, can break the darkness that has gathered anywhere we go. We need to be obedient to go where he sends us and to live lives that shine that light and don't, don't point to the darkness instead. Are you doing this? Are we doing this? Are we leaving the afterimage of Jesus in the eyes of those who look at us? Or do they only see us? If you'll bow your heads and hearts with me, I'd like to close us with a word of prayer. Father, we are so grateful to be here, sitting and free to worship you and listen to your word. The believers in Crete probably weren't anywhere near so free, but like them, we live in a world of darkness that seems to be growing always bleaker. Please work in our hearts and our lives to transform us, to change us to look more like you, so that we can shine the image of Jesus into the world around us and the lives of those around us. Use us as your torches to bring your hope to the darkness and give us strength to shine brightly, even when those around us don't want us to. Thank you for who you are and for making us yours. We don't deserve it. We never could. And we are so very grateful. We love you. Amen. Thank you. Awesome word of God. Very powerful. More blessing to you in Jesus' name. Let us all rise as we close the service in singing of the message of the Lord upon our life today. forth to the Holy Spirit, continue to guide us, continue to direct our path. And for as many that are yet to know you, Lord Jesus, your word has come forth as light. Let it touch them, let it meet them at the point of their needs, Lord. Let them come and bow down and confess you as their Lord and Savior. Go with us this week, abide with us, never leave nor forsake us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.